My name is Stan Forzik. I'm actually in uh, one of the conference rooms within the State Capitol Building in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, I work with a group of folks uh, on the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, and We've been talking to different delegates here, also in Washington, D.C., and we've met for, with different cities and, and state capitals around the United States. And uh, We are pushing for certain things dealing with, and that is the subject matter, mat, mat, subject matter for today, and that's infrastructure. I started my career many years ago uh, with a degree in accounting and it gravitated over towards the infrastructure side. I became the uh, first director of finance for Amtrak's Northeast Corridor, uh, actually starting at Amtrak in the finance department and gravitating over because I was selected as a project manager for the conveyance of all bankrupt railroad infrastructure to Amtrak. So I'm the person who accepted all of those facilities from uh, New York or Boston all the way out to Chicago and LA, uh, California. Uh, so I put on the values and put it on Amtrak's books uh, with the approval of the FRA. Uh, after working on that, as I mentioned, I became uh, the Director of Finance for Northeast Corridor, held that position for quite a number of years, actually worked as liaison between the Chief Engineer of Amtrak <coughs> and uh, the overall Finance Department on several different projects and later becoming the Director of Operations Support. It's at that time that I really started getting into infrastructure. I've worked on many different infrastructure projects. Uh, the replacement of old dilapidated frequency converters within the Northeast Corridor, uh, a $500 million project. I was also the project manager for the electrification project between New Haven, Connecticut and Boston, Massachusetts, a $3 billion project funded by the FRA. Uh, along the way, similar projects developed uh, the re-enhancement of Chicago Union Station uh, and, and different projects like that, including uh, the development of a CWR, that's Continuous Welded Rail Plant, up in the New Haven, Connecticut area. So I'm intimately familiar with um, infrastructure. I also worked for several years on uh, development of policies and procedures for the AREA, the forerunner, that's the American Railway uh, Engineering Association, which was the predecessor of ARIMA. I did their uh, infrastructure reporting procedures and their property accounting procedures to account for all of their facilities. I'm also considered a, an expert in electric traction and transit matters before the FERC and three uh, state utility commissions. commissions. Uh, but we really want to talk about infrastructure today and where we are. And this country is in an infrastructure crisis. Uh, I don't think you have to go too far before you can start talking to someone about the problems that we face. And we face it in many different aspects. And what I'm talking about is not infrastructure the way it's being used today for IT projects where we have infrastructure uh, that, that we're creating for different systems that companies use. I'm talking about major infrastructure like uh, electric supply systems, water supply systems, high-speed rail, different things like that where the infrastructure has to be improved upon to bring uh, everything up to a state of good repair. In this country, infrastructure was created in the 19th and 20th century. We live in the 21st century. That's a long time and we haven't had a really decent infrastructure program to actually bring things up to a state of good repair for more than 50 years. 
So our infrastructure, let's just take the example of railroads, our road beds are 150 years old. Uh, only the Northeast Corridor has rail development to the point where they can actually get some semblance of high-speed rail. Everything is old and dilapidated. Alexander Hamilton had the idea of putting in manufacturing and construction way back when he designed the first uh, National Infrastructure Bank. And he had chosen Patterson, New Jersey as the location for putting in the first manufacturing facilities in this country. Nowadays, Patterson, New Jersey is known for two things. Dilapidated old warehouses and manufacturing plants and a statue to Lou Costello. <laughs> and that's it. All right. And, and these dilapidated plants are in all urban areas. And we go and, and we talk to different people in different cities like Trenton, Newark, uh, Philadelphia. These urban areas have all of these warehouses just sitting there. And the only reason why they're sitting there is that they have cell towers on the, ta uh, on the roofs of the buildings and the cities are getting revenue so they can't knock down the buildings. Not only that, but a lot of cities don't even know who owns those buildings. This is a very serious problem, all right? And you're not going to get any answers on these problems from politicians and Congress or folks like that because they're going to say there's not enough money. Well, there really isn't enough money. No one knows what to do, all right? We have high regulation and we've got a lack of funding. Therefore, no projects are really being worked on. We've had projects whereby uh, different municipalities and states put through and, and get a certain amount of funding, but they're band-aid solutions. They don't go all the way. And when people get into it deeper and deeper, change proposals have to come up so that a million dollar project becomes a two million dollar project. And all these things just cascade upward and nobody can fund it. We believe we have a solution to that. And that's a national infrastructure bank. In actuality, the fourth one that this country has had. As I mentioned, Alexander Hamilton came up with the design. He had the first national infrastructure bank. John Quincy Adams had the second national infrastructure bank. Abraham Lincoln started the uh, American banking system and a national infrastructure bank. And then the fourth one was created by utilizing some paperwork shuffling uh, by FDR, who created the New Deal, and brought us all the way up into the 1950s. And that's the last time any big infrastructure push has been made. And infrastructure is falling apart, all right? The American Society of uh, Civil Engineers estimates that to bring the infrastructure up to a state of good repair is going to take approximately $4.6 trillion. Now that survey was done two years ago. Right now, if we don't do anything to help the infrastructure in this country, help the cities in this, con in this country, help the people in this country by upgrading the infrastructure, in five to eight years, that figure is going to quadruple and we are going to wind up having to ask for $16 trillion for infrastructure projects. I mentioned uh, at the American Society of um, uh, Civil Engineers. They have a listing of um, infrastructure projects throughout the United States. And they, they know in relatively to the amount of money that has to be spent for each one of those projects, what would be the return on that investment. So all of these things have been outlined, but we, we fail to get the important information out there, and that is a way to fund it. There are people who are working on regulations and the elimination of certain regulatory units that actually increase the price of projects. We have people who are putting in for projects, as I mentioned, that use the, the standard PPP analysis 
where we're always bringing in different banks to fund different things and, it's, and developers are coming in and we're actually spending more money for the projects. We want to cut that back. We want to spend what is actually necessary. So we talked about how old the infrastructure is. Some of us have been to other countries and they say, why don't we have what they have? Why don't we have an infrastructure that actually works, that helps the people? Why don't we have high-speed rail? Why can't we do those things? Well, we can't do those things because we have a, a political system whereby people fight in an appropriations process for specific projects. And not necessarily meaning the best project gets picked, but the people who force that project to get in gets it approved. And that's a problem. That's why nothing gets done. All right? We want to take things from the appropriations process, create the fifth national infrastructure bank. Did I mention that these infrastructure banks, these four infrastructure banks, all ended or came to term in the black? Which means, and I'm sure those who are watching this know, that a large infrastructure project actually supports the revenue or supports a revenue stream that comes in to refund different other projects. Infrastructure projects also create job opportunities. We estimate that if we can get a bank to fund $4.6 4 trillion worth of projects, we can put 25 million people to work. Now, a lot of people will say, well, we're, the unemployment's so low, there, there's nothing really out there. But that's not true, and everybody knows it. All right? There are people who are in a malaise, who really can't consider themselves part of the workforce because they don't see any career path that they can go on. They're, they're, they're stuck in the morass of doing nothing is better than, than being on the wrong job at the wrong time. We want to create jobs, all right? We, and the reason why we want to create them is because we want to teach our younger people. Right now, if you don't go to college, you fall into that malaise. We don't want that. We want to use apprenticeship programs. We want to pay union wages. We want to be able to do everything necessary to make this country great again. And our country is great, but we have to make it greater. I started mentioning the other countries and what's going on there. The other countries were all pummeled during World War II. All right? There was no infrastructure left. There was none in China. There was none in Europe. There was none in Russia. The United States has always, whether it been World War II, World War I, provided funding so that the war machines of other countries came up to speed. And when wars ended, we supported those countries to bring them back into the point where they can be cleaned up and new uh, infrastructure could be built. So within those countries in the 1960s and the 1970s, infrastructure was designed and put through. High-speed rail was designed and put through. They used new technology. We are still in the dark ages as far as that technology is concerned because we cannot build anything because we don't have the money. Now, let's ask ourselves, how did those countries, after we bailed them out from the world wars, how did they fund their infrastructure? How did they get high-speed rail? Was it miraculously delivered? No. What they did was basically take the Alexander Hamilton model that we're talking about, that we're going around the Congress for. They took it and they used it for their own benefit. So they're using an American model to develop projects and fund those projects, and that's why everything is progressing. 
They took our model, they work with it. We talk to people in Congress and they're saying, I didn't realize that Alexander Hamilton created the first national infrastructure bank. I wasn't aware of it. Well, there are a lot of people who aren't aware of it, and they're just not getting it that this is a way out. And how is it a way out? The National Infrastructure Bank that was created actually monetizes debt. It takes existing debt, like Alexander Hamilton took the debt from the Revolutionary War and monetized it. Money was created, and therefore he was able to pay off and start building everything that was necessary to get the, co the country, the United States, out of an agricultural mode to a manufacturing mode. That's exactly the same thing that John Quincy Adams did. That's the exact same thing that we're pushing for here. People don't, they, they don't want to understand that. But it's a very easy concept. Four trillion dollars in the banking industry means that approximately 500 billion dollars needs to be created so the bank can operate. How do they get that? The country now is in 22 trillion dollar debt. There are treasuries in the Federal Reserve Bank that other countries own. Uh, unions uh, fund a certain amount to buy those treasuries. So do other banks, so do other countries. All right? What we're saying is we want to monetize at least $500 billion so that we could start what we, we want to take. $500 billion, we want other countries to take their treasuries out of the Federal Reserve or leave them there and buy treasuries in this bank so that this bank can function with $500 billion. All right, and once it gets established, and we've got legislation in front of uh, Congress, and people have been reviewing it for the last couple months. It's been rewritten in uh, congressional format. It's been vetted before several representatives, uh, the National Association of Governors, uh, uh, the Congressional Review Panel. So we know we've got uh, a certain amount of people looking at it. They would like to hear from grassroots people and that's why we're talking in Pennsylvania today. We're, 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 we're trying to go through everything. Uh, I was just reminded to go through a certain amount of projects. Let's talk about some of the projects that are on uh, the listing, all right? We have the, the major project in New York, New Jersey, which controls 20% of the GDP, and that's the Gateway Project. That is to build a new station uh, and, and uh, uh, trackage from a certain por portion of Manhattan outside of Penn Station to come through two new tunnels into New Jersey and then down into Washington. I'm very familiar with it because there are two existing tunnels that are in such poor condition that they're going to become, uh, uh, they're going to be submerged in water very shortly. Uh, Amtrak has told the FRA about those tunnels in 1988. They continue to get worse. Something's got to get done. That's a project that this bank can handle. It's my understanding, let's just take uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, all right, where we've got a tunnel that we've overspent on and it's already gridlocked and different other things have to be done. Pittsburgh needs a bus system. Flint, Michigan needs a wa new water system. So does Newark, so does Providence, Rhode Island, so does Chicago. There are water systems throughout the country that are putting lead into the, country, into the water systems of schools and the residences. We need to eliminate those things. We've spoken in Newark, we've spoken to all these people, and everybody agrees. Not only do we have problems with those water supply systems, uh, I'll give you an example on one of the lists, uh, some of the folks who might be in Ohio, all right, there's the Upper Ohio Navigation System that uh, has to be put in. It's on the civil engineer's list. 
Uh, the Ohio Waste to Energy Generation Plant is on the list. The Mariner East 2 all right, is also on that list, but that's combined in with two different states. Highways in this country. New Jersey spent a lot of money on six extra lanes for the New Jersey Turnpike. They were put in three years ago. But what happened? It's a Band-Aid fix. It's already gridlocked. And if we go up to certain exits on the New Jersey Turnpike and we go to the jug handles, we can see that they're falling apart, that the rebar is coming out from the curbing, that the bridges underneath have to be uh, uh, rebuilt and everything like that. So it's nice to have Band-Aid solutions and people enjoy those things, but nothing gets done. Natural gas systems. Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard about the explosion that occurred in out just outside of downtown Philadelphia a couple months ago uh, where a refinery had blown up and they, they tracked it all the way back to a gas distribution line that was old and had ruptured and that's what's causing that problem and the same thing exists in other cities where natural gas distribution lines are becoming old. I mean, natural gas was put into some of these cities 50 years ago. The water systems 100 years ago. Everything is falling apart. Across the country, not all the states have broadband. All right? Broadband ha should be available to everyone. There are schools that have no broadband so that the students can use their, their uh, laptops or anything else for, for learning. The teachers have nothing because there is no broadband. We want to bring broadband in everywhere. FDR wanted to put in electricity across the country. The National Rural Electric Association said that they needed to bring it to all, city, uh, all states and cities. And what happened was FDR got together with uh, some of the uh, powerful folks who uh, managed the grids and said, get together, we've got to get electricity put in. Everybody deserves it. Everybody wants it. And within 10 minutes, all of the points were negotiated, and that's why we have electricity throughout the United States. We want the same for broadband. Take the example of the TVA that was put in, which actually took swamplands, desolate lakes, different things like that, actually created a generation system built on hydroelectric facilities and actually supports mid-America as far as electricity generation. So all these types of projects have to be done. And, the, and we see that there's only one way to do it, and that is the creation of a national infrastructure bank. It has to be done, and it has to be done now. All right, And it's a very simple process. We believe that a board would be created if legislation would go through. Politics would come away. The board would review all of the projects that are out there and approve them one by one so that the workforce can be created to do those things. That's what we want, all right? Politics eliminated. And the board that I just mentioned is not going to be made up of anyone who doesn't have any infrastructure experience because we believe it's critical to get some of these uh, projects off the ground. And the bank's not just going to be a bank. The bank is going to have individuals internally that can help municipalities with a water supply problem, that can help states with highway problems, because they will help, instead of just having their own project managers try to put a project together, they can ask for assistance, and we would offer that assistance, the bank would offer that assistance to anyone who needs it. And that's the way we would like it to operate. I think you have to take the time out to listen to what I'm saying and what other people are saying. Legislation is moving forward. We have to get behind it. We talk to the politicians. 
We've talked to the labor and craft unions. They are behind it because they want to put in their own apprenticeship programs. And people really want that. I have a son who has a friend who works in the Gulf as an undersea welder. He started working about 10 or 12 years ago. He worked six months on, six months off, going out to one of the rigs, living there, and then coming off. Well, nowadays, all right, it has gotten to the point where he goes out there for nine months and then has, has three months off. Now they're saying that he's got to spend a year out there to have three months off. And the whole reason for that is there are no undersea welders. There's no one to take his place. That's why apprenticeship programs are important. Because we want to take those individuals who don't have a job, who don't have any aspirations for a career, and say we can put them to work by doing infrastructure projects throughout the United States. I appreciate your time. I hope you got something out of this. You can always call me uh, and I can answer any question you have. Thanks again for your time.